So let me just introduce the speaker. Um, our final speaker for this session is Professor Shubhadeep Gupta, and he too joins us from the United States. Um, Professor Shubhadeep Gupta did his PhD at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, studying quantum degenerate bores and Fermi gases. His postdoctoral tenure was at University of California, Berkeley, studying, amongst other things, cavity nonlinear optics using collective atomic motions. He joined the Department of Physics, University of Washington, Seattle in 2007 and is currently a professor there. He heads an experimental anthropod atomic physics group, which uses quantum degenerate bosonic and fermionic gases of lithium and ytterbium to explore a wide range of quantum mechanical phenomena. Uh, today, he will talk us about, tell us about uh, tuning interactions in ultra-cold gases, superfluid mixtures, molecules, transport. Um, uh, Professor Gupta, would you like to take uh, questions at the end of your talk or in between is also okay? In between is also okay. In, okay, great. So if you can uh, finish the talk, let's say five to six minutes earlier than the allotted time, it will be very nice for discussions. Yeah. Is that great. okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah Thanks. that's fine. That's yeah. fine. Please go ahead and start. Okay, Th thank you so much. Um, so it's it's great great to be here uh, in this in this virtual format, notwithstanding. Um, as as uh, as introduced, I'm Deep Gupta. I'm at uh, University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I, I actually grew up in Kolkata, um, and just a short walk from um, the ISCS in Jalapur. So it's. Um, um, Attending a conference in India is like going home. I understand this pandemic situation, everything is, everything's become virtual. And I thank the organizers very much for putting together this great uh, conference and for including our work in the program. I'm ha very happy to be here. So um, I'm going to be talking about a few experiments in our uh, uh, group, um, which has the theme of tuning interactions in ultra cold gases. In the first one, uh, I'm going to be uh, discussing a realization of uh, two element Bose Fermi double superfluid in which the interatomic interactions are through a Feshbach resonance between two spin states of uh, one element, in our case, lithium, uh, which creates the Fermi superfluid. Um, in another work, I'll tell you about uh, our experiments on. Uh, combining ytterbium and lithium atoms. Uh, and here the interactions are between the two different elements. Um, and I'll, in, this, uh, in this part, I'll tell you about photo association resonances as well as Feshbach resonances between these two species. And um, in the third part, uh, which is a more, more recent uh, work, it's actually not yet published, uh, I'll tell you about some experiments on uh, many body dynamical delocalization in which uh, we, we see the spread of an atomic distribution, in this case in momentum space, driven by interactions. Okay, so just to very quickly uh, set the scale, I know you've been hearing uh, talks, a lot of talks about uh, cold atoms and cold ions and cold molecules and so on. Uh, very quickly, uh, let me just um, uh, put, the, put the key energy and temperature and length scales and in context. It's the, the coldest, really, that, that we, can, uh, we can make things in, in the lab. Uh, the, um, everything, the, uh, or most of the interactions uh, we have going on are S wave uh, because the temperatures are below the P wave threshold of a millikelvin or so. Um, where the uh, de Broglie wavelength is on the scale of few nanometers at that point. And then in the quantum degenerate regime, you're at the uh, few hundred nanometer de Broglie wavelength where this length scale becomes on the order of the interparticle spacing. And at this point, you're at a micro Kelvin. Typically experiments are in that regime or even below. And uh, the confinement is in, the, um, in traps where the ground state oscillator uh, energy maybe is a few nanokelvins or so. And this, uh, this gap in, in energy from what we're uh, normally encountering to these ultra low temperatures is through the sequence of laser and evaporative cooling. And uh, a typical sample that we will end up with 
as routine in, in most labs working on this, these sorts of experiments, maybe 100,000 particles at maybe 100 nanokelvin with densities of 10 to the 14 per cubic centimeter. These are the, the neutral atom systems. And, and this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, very low level of energy, good control over quantum states um, and interactions being um, controllable and, and, and not th that, that huge, uh, mostly two body, uh, makes it a great starting point for studies and various studies in quantum physics and can study old ones, and create uh, new systems, uh, great platform for quantum simulation, quantum information processing, and also new kinds of precision measurements. And you've been hearing many of these uh, through the school and the, and the conference. So in, in our case, we have one atom from the alkali column, lithium, and uh, another one from the uh, group two. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a, it has the electronic structure of a group two atom. It's deuterium uh, over, over here. Um, it's a two-electron atom, and uh, importantly, it's not uh, it's not an alkali atom, a closed shell atom. The other other ones that are colored are, to my knowledge, the ones that have been um, brought to quantum degeneracy in different labs. Our apparatus looks something like this um, on the uh, length scale of. Uh, a regular optical table uh, with the two species being fed into a common vacuum chamber through two different um, atomic beam setups. Lithium uh, here is shown in red, uh, terbium in blue. Here's a, a photo of, our, uh, of a part of our laser system. It's, um, it's kind of visual because lithium's strong transition is at red, 671 nanometers. Actually, we, we saw a picture of this earlier in Salik's talk. Um, and uh, ytterbium, the magneto-optic trapping is at 556 nanometers, which is nice and green. So here's a, um, a sequence of photographs taken as the two species are uh, combined um, uh, in, in, uh, in a co-located magneto-optic traps, after which uh, they proceed or they are coaxed into an optical dipole trap. In our case, uh, optical dipole trap wavelength is about one micrometers. And because the AC Stark shift is different uh, for the two species at that wavelength, it's about a factor of two different. And because the masses are quite different, uh, the trapping frequencies end up being a factor of eight or so apart. And the, the sequence in which we do our cooling is we, we cool uh, the terbium in a regular evaporative cooling way, and the lithium gets sympathetically cooled. We, we do a few um, uh, 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 adaptations of uh, regular evaporative cooling uh, called painting in which we uh, increase, the, increase the size of the optical dipole trap in a in a controlled way, um, but those details, uh, if you're interested, can be found in this paper here. So once things are working well, um, the combined system can produce uh, quantum degenerate gases of either bosons or fermions, or a combination. In this case, there's a coexistence of a quantum degenerate Bose gas of ytterbium. You have a Bose-Einstein condensate. And here is the degenerate Fermi gas of lithium. And what these uh, dashes show, uh, this dash line here shows uh, attempt at a Maxwell Boltzmann uh, distribution fit, which fails. And one has to do a Fermi Dirac distribution fit in order to get the correct temperature. So um, on top of cooling um, uh, the, the particles down to these quantum degenerate temperatures, one can uh, look at how to control their interactions. And that's a, that's a key enabling element for many uh, atomic physics applications today. Uh, and one, one um, standard one, I guess I should say, is the so-called Feshbach resonance in which uh, you have the, um, uh, a, 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 
a degeneracy between a uh, pair of uh, uh, free atoms and the bound state of those same atoms. And you tune the degeneracy condition or the, you tune the energy uh, splitting between these two states by an external magnetic field. And earlier today, uh, there was a talk by Professor Rudy Grimm uh, in which these Feshbach resonances um, were, were discussed and applied. So this is how, uh, well, this is what happens when the magnetic field is tuned. Uh, and um, in the case of uh, the lithium system, there are two entering uh, lithium atoms in the so-called triplet, uh, triplet configuration uh, comes into resonance with a bound state in the singlet configuration. And uh, this, they have different magnetic moments, so you can tune the uh, energy difference between these and have access to a range of X-wave scattering lengths. So this is a very well used um, a Feshbach resonance in the field. Um, this magnetic Feshbach resonance of uh, six lithium uh, between the two hyperfine ground states of six lithium occurs at around 830 Gauss. Uh, and around this point, the scattering length, S-wave scattering length can be uh, expressed in, in this fashion. This is a way to get very strong interactions between uh, fermions. And there's a natural um, connection now to strongly interacting fermions from other, uh, other parts of physics, from other walks of life, uh, if you will. Uh, so this system is often been called uh, the hydrogen atom of many body physics or the harmonic oscillator of, of many body physics. Uh, it's, um, it, it has uh, implication for um, uh, thinking about the fermions in, in neutron stars, um, as well as uh, the fermions, uh, which are the, the electrons uh, that pair up uh, to form uh, Cooper pairs, superconductors. So that's wide ranging application. In in our um, in our experiment, we um, we can we can make this by um, cooling the system at this uh, close to the peak of the magnetic Feshbach resonance. And in order to see that we have created the superfluid state, the paired state, um, we can move the system to a place where uh, you have more deeply bound. Uh, molecules, uh, uh, and and uh, observe then the condensation of these molecules. So in this case, uh, from our observations of this condensation of of uh, uh, these these paired uh, lithium atoms, we can deduce that the uh, Fermi superfluid exists at about half of its critical temperature. So uh, that first part that I was uh, alluding to earlier uh, comes into context when you think about um, what uh, the more traditional superfluids from uh, condensed matter, which have been around for a lot longer, the helium mix, uh, the, the helium systems, uh, liquid helium systems, four helium and three helium, even though they're independently uh, brought to superfluidity, when you try to uh, bring them to superfluidity together, um, you get impeded by the strong dose Fermi repulsions. And even though uh, experiments are continuing uh, till today, um, it's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's not been possible. So atomic systems, given their lower density and interaction control possibilities, um, offers an opportunity to create new kinds of quantum systems, even paradigm quantum systems that, uh, that you couldn't otherwise. So uh, this is our um, uh, our um, um, demonstration of this, where uh, ytterbium bose einstein condensate and lithium paired uh, superfluid coexist. This was from a few years back, and this was uh, the the first with different elements simultaneous with another uh, group in China in who worked on it with potassium and lithium. And there was an early realization in a two isotope system in Christoph Salomon's group in Paris. Now, um, after making the system, uh, we looked at some 
collective uh, dynamics uh, in the system. And uh, one straightforward way to, um, to, to look at the interactions, how these superfluids play with each other, uh, we, uh, we excited dipole oscillations in one of them. So we excited dipole oscillations in the ytterbium uh, gas by uh, uh, displacing its center and then uh, adiabatically displacing its center and then um, quickly moving it, moving the center back and it starts to uh, move, uh, move up and down. And this is the, um, what, what you see here is us recording how it's oscillating and therefore measuring its frequency. And if you do this with and without the presence of the other uh, element, the other superfluid, then you can look at the uh, difference between these two oscillations. And you can see from here that even though they started basically at the same phase of oscillation, by the time they're here, they've gone out of phase. And from this, you can uh, extract a frequency shift between them. And from that, uh, because you also know um, uh, because you also know the original trap uh, things are in, you can back out then how the two species are interacting with each other. And uh, uh, a shot of this was that uh, the frequency shift was consistent with the mean field model uh, of the system. And the uh, interaction was repulsive. So the, um, um, in the presence of the lithium, the terbium would oscillate a little bit slower because it was being uh, because it was being repelled and the effective trap became a bit weaker. Okay, so uh, another thing we looked at with this combined system was um, exchange of angular momentum uh, between the two, and we um, we looked at this by. Uh, yeah. Mr. Gupta, there is a question here. Would like to yeah, take. go ahead. Yeah, Saikat, can you unmute and ask? Yeah, it's regarding that gap in, gap of data in the middle. Is it from like different shots and different realizations or is it a single shot? Okay, okay, uh, thanks for that question. Yeah, each is a different uh, shot. Each is in fact an average of three different shots um, in which the system is prepared. The experiment uh, is done by um, setting up the system, exciting the oscillation and waiting for a particular period of time and then stopping uh, the experiment taking the, the image of the experiment uh, of the atoms. And for the next iteration, you have to do it all over again after changing the hold time. And so, so how yeah. is the phase maintained? Sorry, sorry, that's it. How is the phase maintained for the oscillations then? Like if it's- Oh, because, it, because you start it identically each time. Okay. You, you start, yeah. Yeah. So the preparation so this, is very identical. Uh, yeah, yeah. The atom number may be a little bit different, but the, how the potential is shifted uh, slowly at first and then very quickly, that timing is spot on each time. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll proceed. Yeah. So um, here, um, here because, um, uh, because the two traps, the traps for the two species are not actually exactly concentric, um, or ex don't exactly share the same center, So I'm, I'm sorry, I may not be able to see the chat each time. So if there's a question, please feel free to, 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 to stop and speak up. Um, uh, because they're not, because the center is not identical, um, uh, the movement or this dipole oscillation of one of the gases um, uh, generates a, a torque. Okay. So that torque can drive, um, can provide angular momentum uh, therefore. And what we observed was a particular excitation of a superfluid uh, angular, which contains angular momentum, uh, oscillating angular momentum called a scissors mode. And there the, um, uh, uh, and if a uh, non-isotropic system undergoes oscillations, which can look like this. So the angle with respect to some axis oscillates in time. So in the absence of uh, the other, the second superfluid, we didn't see this while in the presence of it, we did indeed indeed see this. And this is studied 
at a couple of different uh, interaction strings. And uh, here are some Fourier transforms of the data. The, um, uh, the, the frequency of these oscillations is consistent with what one would expect from this sort of uh, XIT. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, switch over to the second part of the, of the talk in which I'm gonna talk about interactions between lithium and ytterbium or tuning interactions between lithium and ytterbium. So it's in the context of diatomic molecules. Uh, we just heard uh, Tanya Zalvinsky give a really great talk on molecules and I'm gonna use um, uh, the motivations were already presented to you a little while earlier, but let me for completeness add a few more things. Um, we get new degrees of freedom uh, with molecules so the scientific reach possible with cold atoms can be enhanced some more. But of course it comes with uh, um, technical challenges as well. It's a lot easier to cool directly atoms than it is to cool molecules. So um, the tack a lot of people take is to individually cool the atoms in the same trap and then try to combine them together. And uh, the kinds of um, uh, the kinds of uh, new things that are possible uh, comes with these new degrees of freedom. For instance, an electric dipole moment uh, can give rise to long range interactions, which are lacking in most uh, just atomic systems. The uh, ytterbium lithium molecule has a, a relatively modest ground state dipole moment, but it has a reasonably high a uh, high one in, um, in, in a certain excited states. And importantly, uh, it's, uh, it would be a new uh, class of ultra gold molecules. So the ones that have been brought to, uh, to, to ground states, so there's the homonuclear ones that, um, that um, Tanya spoke about, uh, strontium too, um, amongst the heteronuclear ones, which would possess these electric dipole moments, the ones that have been uh, brought to ground states and uh, tamed to the ground state are the bi-alkali ones, where the true ground state actually doesn't have a magnetic moment. So the, the new thing that such a system like this could bring is then this, ex this extra degree of freedom from the unpaired electron. I recall lithium was the alkali, ytterbium is a closed shell atom. Um, so, the new possibilities that can emerge now are um, from paramagnetic uh, polar molecules. Uh, they would be magnetically trappable. The molecules themselves, uh, two, in, two individual molecules could have feshbach resonances. Um, you could study chemical reactions which are now spin controlled. And this extra degree of freedom is at the heart of several uh, proposals. Um, uh, for enhanced quantum simulation or quantum information processing schemes and some references over here. These, uh, to my knowledge, are the bialkali systems that have been brought to uh, the ground state thus far. Uh, Professor Gupta, there's a question yeah. here uh, uh, yeah. in the chat box. Would you like to see it? Yeah. 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 I... yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I can ask. Uh, Saura, could you unmute and please ask oh, the question? Yeah, yeah OK. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, hi. So this uh, dipole moment, has this been measured? Because I recall that there was some dis discrepancy between some calculations of Olivier Deleuve and uh, very early on, I think the uh, Andre Derivianko, that somebody said that there is a dipole moment, there isn't a dipole moment. So has it, I mean, has it been measured, this uh, thing? It has not been measured, but you're right. There's many calculations. I know of like four or five uh, calculations um, of this and I think even uh, Bhanu Das might have been involved in one of them as well. Um, and I don't think there's an agreement, so um, oh, okay. measurement yeah. would be great, but we're yeah, not we're nice. not there very yet. Nice. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, good. Okay. Okay, thanks. Sadiq, you have a question? Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, Deep, uh, just a um, yeah. question. You see, the, this is often said that, you know, the, the magnetic moment is going to be in a different direction from the electric dipole moment. But I mean, isn't there this thing of a vector of operators all collapsing on the same uh, on the same axis uh, because of Wigner-Eckert? 
So, okay. uh -huh. uh, so, so, so I, I'm not so sure whether the magnetic moment is an independent, um, you know, degree of freedom in terms of at least the angle. I see. Okay, that's that's quite. Um, I, I I'm not sure I can fully uh, respond to that, but it is uh, another degree of freedom and. The proposals that I've seen uh, rely on the uh, new term in the Hamiltonian, which coming from the spin rotation coupling. So, um, uh, so it does introduce a new term in the Hamiltonian, which can then be um, applied to do some something yeah. useful. I will torture you on this question later. Oh, okay. all right. Looking forward to that. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Just go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, as several of you know, I think uh, the, the 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 way in which uh, this is um, this battle is fought is to first um, combine uh, into combine the atoms into a weakly bound molecule, and then do some uh, two-photon Raman process to get to some targeted final state. And what I'll tell you about is um, some uh, photo association work in which we identified the uh, bound, various bound states. And then uh, using the locations of these bound states, we were able to um, deduce where the fresh park resonances would be, uh, and uh, then went and observed and studied those fresh park resonances. So this is a quick uh, reminder of that fresh park resonance uh, action. Now, importantly, or, and this has been, this is, I'm putting it in one slide, but, but this is, this is a lot of work to, um, to approach experimentally. For bialkali collisions, you have, um, you have hyperfine, well, you have, you have spin from both um, partners. And so you have terms that have I1.S1 and I2.S2 uh, terms in there. And you have singlet and triplet potentials, which can then get coupled. When you have one closed shell atom and one uh, open shell atom, that's not the case. And we have to rely on a much weaker interaction via, via the nuclear spin of the closed shell atom and the electron spin of the open shell atom. So this was originally uh, proposed as a coupling mechanism by uh, Jeremy Hudson several years back, but it's taken a while to, to actually realize this. So I'll be, uh, that's, that's where I'm moving towards. Um, Deuterium lithium, um, as far as I know, was the spectrum was not known um, until we started looking at it. And how you look at it, how we look at it was the traditional uh, photo association spectroscopy uh, method, which is used in several labs, in which you just shine uh, a laser beam at a wavelength, which is a little low, um, uh, 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 a frequency a little bit lower than the um, than the bare atom uh, optical resonance. And you tune it around until you start um, seeing some losses and you identify those losses with molecular bound states in the excited channel. And here's one sample uh, spectrum thereof. Uh, and um, you can track this down through the, uh, through the various, um, through the various um, uh, bound state levels by tuning your frequency and looking for losses. And you, you're helped a little bit, a little bit needle in a haystack, but you're helped a little bit by um, uh, this, uh, this formula, the Leroy Bernstein formula appropriate for um, one over R to the sixth potentials. And you can do this now in the ground state as well. You a, a, an excited state uh, potential, uh, excited state uh, um, a particular excited state with one of your laser beams and you tune a second one to uh, address um, bound states in the ground potential. And we went ahead and did that and found uh, several of them. And uh, in order to uh, coherently, um, uh, in order to show some um, uh, coherence uh, between uh, atoms and molecules, um, we employed a, uh, an EIT type scheme, which also we, we heard about earlier, in which um, we, you think about a 
three state system in which the two ground states are the two free atoms and uh, uh, two atom bound state and the excited state uh, forming the lambda is an excited molecule. And if your lasers are uh, slot, then one of the, uh, you, you can probe one of the states of this three level system, which is a dark state uh, superposition of two ground states here. And indeed we, we do, we did see that uh, this hole um, in the spectrum when you tune um, uh, when, when you tune the frequency of the up leg laser, the laser uh, connecting to one of the, the, the excited state. So you can use this to um, identify very sharply what the binding energy is. So at on, on, on one side, this tells us there's coexistence of ytterbium lithium uh, molecules in the electronic ground state with these atoms. It's a very small fraction that's coexisting, but still it's nonetheless there because we see this signal. Uh, additionally, this, this tells us exactly or, or very precisely where, uh, where the bound state is. And we use this to identify the first uh, bound state in the ground potential which is the one that's, uh, that generates the magnetic Feshbach resonance that I'll get into now. So this is written up over here and our theory collaborator uh, for this is Svetlana Korjigova at Temple University. Um, this is just showing how that resonance moves with magnetic field, uh, um, telling us that in, indeed the atom, uh, the molecule has magnetic moment, which, which of course we do. Okay, so I'm going to move into this magnetic fetchback resonance part now. All the spectroscopy that we had uh, done really helped us identify very precisely uh, where this, um, this first bound state is. So the blue are, is the hyperfine structure um, of the atomic states. So ytterbium um, uh, has no um, unpaired electrons, so the, the real um, uh, hyperfine structure really comes uh, from the the lithium atom, at least the, all the all the strong stuff here. And you see a similar structure for the first bound state of ytterbium lithium, so the first one below below threshold. And these uh, have different magnetic moments and intersect uh, over here. And you zoom in over here, you get this sort of picture. You get these three crossings. You zoom in on any one of these crossings, you get um, this structure here. So this one uh, uh, down here is the zoom in of the middle triangle. And you, you get this extra spread because of the nuclear spin associated with the ytterbium here. And I, I didn't stress this, but um, the, the isotope that we're using in this experiment is ytterbium 173, which has a nuclear spin of five halves. So there's six um, uh, nuclear, nuclear spin uh, projections. This is the form of coupling that uh, that I had mentioned earlier, S of lithium dotted with I of ytterbium. And if you look at this, you can, uh, I think, uh, see that uh, Ms plus Mi will be uh, conserved. Prof. Gupta, there yeah. is a question here. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Saurav, could you please ask? Uh, again, uh, Saurav. Yeah. So in yes, your previous you. previous slide, you showed this uh, uh, last data where you said that there's a dark state. And, but you see, the, the, I could say that uh, there is a AC star C or outlet towns kind of effect between the two ground, uh, two bound molecular states. And when you tune your PA laser, you basically measure that, that. I mean, so it does, does it really prove that there is a coherence between atom and molecule? Oh, uh, okay. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. When you go measure this uh, width of this thing, um, I didn't uh, stress it, but it's a lot less than the natural uh, line width of the excited state, uh, six lithium here. So I think that would uh, that would then no. suggest that, yeah. So we got it down to like hundred kilohertz or maybe a bit less, and uh, that's uh, and the excited state line width of lithium is six megahertz. Right, but the uh, but. You, you were splitting outlet uh, transmitting could be less than the line width, as far as I understand. Isn't that true? I, I don't know. Okay, let's. Uh, 
Okay, let's move on. Um, in that case, it maybe we're talking about the same thing here, because yeah, okay. <laughs> then because that, 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 that we may be talking about the same thing. And probably the outlet towns converts into this picture uh, that uh, uh, that you have this dark state in which the coherence, uh, sorry, the excitation from the two paths that could take you up there destructively interfere. Okay. okay, fine, fine. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Oops, okay. So, um, right, if you look at the form of this interaction here, I think you can convince yourself that the M sub S and M sub I, uh, the, the sum of that um, will, be, uh, will, be, um, will be preserved, will be conserved because you have an S dot I kind of uh, interaction. And that's the reason uh, why, because uh, in these resonances, um, the M S, changes by, by one because the lithium goes from, um, in the atomic state, it's in minus half and the molecular state's plus half. And therefore the MI also has to change by one in the other direction. And that's why there's one resonance missing here. Like this, this um, th there's gonna be five resonances because MI has to change by one. So uh, we, we, we go looking for these things. Now, now that we had a very precise number for where that bound state is, uh, these resonances are actually very, 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 very sharp. So um, if we didn't have a good idea of where they were, it would be very hard to go looking for them. So indeed we do find uh, these resonances here measured in, in number loss uh, at the predicted values. And um, I mentioned here that uh, these sorts of resonances and uh, were observed uh, by Florian Schreck's group in strontium rubidium, which has a very similar electronic structure uh, uh, in, uh, in 2018. And uh, in our work, we observed it in ytterbium lithium uh, collisions. And um, we also went ahead and studied the magnetic uh, substructure as well as the temperature dependencies, which is what I'll get into now. More recently, I know that uh, it's also been seen in cesium, uh, ytterbium cesium in um, Simon Cornish's group, uh, but I don't think there's a publication yet on it. Right, so these those five resonances that I was mentioning with one missing do indeed show up uh, in, in our work where um, we have to purify the spin state of ytterbium and then uh, put that in combination with the the lithium atoms. And as the magnetic field is changed, depending on which spin state is used, there's a different location of the resonance that we find. And in one of the spin states, there is no resonance. So this checks out. And um, we look at the shift and in combination with theoretical work from uh, A.T. Singa and Svetlana Karjugova, uh, we see that in, in, indeed it does follow uh, what uh, what you would expect, this uh, size of the shift. We also looked at the temperature dependence of these uh, resonances. And here are for four different sample temperatures. And one obvious thing is that things get broader as you get hotter. And the other thing is you see a shift in the resonance location with temperature. And um, that our, our theoretical collaborators built a model uh, about this uh, as well. And the, the sort of the quick take is that it first of all has to shift to the right uh, and that's, uh, or to higher magnetic fields. And that's because, let me just scroll back here. If, uh, if the energy, if the kinetic energy is higher, then the resonances will occur at a, or the crossings will occur at a slightly higher value of the magnetic field. Okay. Just, the, just the way the kinetic energy always has to be positive energy shift for the atoms. So all the blue lines will be slightly moved up. That checks out. And then uh, kinetic energy means there's a broadening of the initial uh, energy um, distribution. And therefore you can imagine that there's a larger range of fields at which um, you would see uh, uh, you would see a resonant effect and the physical process that's happening uh, is, a, is a three body loss 
uh, which is why you see these, uh, you see atom loss. And so this three body uh, loss min uh, maximum moves to higher fields and the, the line width gets, gets broader. How much it moves uh, depends on the relative magnetic moments and the rate, uh, the actual uh, height of these peaks uh, then can also be, be modeled. And what our uh, theory collaborators found was that it does um, obey uh, the, the rate that you would get for uh, collisions between two fermions, uh, collisions between three fermions, one of, um, only one of which is non-identical. I mentioned here that this is also a strongly interacting uh, Fermi Fermi system, which is mass mismatched. In here it's uh, by a factor of 29. It's a very large mass mismatch. And I know earlier today there was uh, there was a talk by Rudy Grimm on mass mismatch Fermi Fermi systems. So I want to point out this connection here. So, um, so we have these magnetic Feshbach resonances. They're very narrow. Um, uh, because of this, this weak coupling that I was discussing. However, we think that it should still be possible to coherently associate into molecules. And this is the, the, the standard picture for thinking about this. You, you, as you sweep magnetic field, you can adiabatically move from two bare atom states to a molecule state. And these are uh, symbols for the associated Rabi frequencies. Here's the re relative magnetic moment. Um, however, you you're going to be you're going to be fighting with other processes which um, um, which which can disturb this um, because the line width is so narrow. Uh, we, we we need to put it into an optical lattice to protect uh, protect the atoms. And this is underway right now. Um, we've actually set up our uh, 3D lattice, and here's some sample uh, images from it. Here's diffraction from a two-dimensional lattice. Here's a Mott insulator transition of the bosons in a 3D lattice. And I'm gonna, hopefully I have a few minutes to, yeah, I'll, I'll do it quickly, I'll do it quickly. So this is very, very recent uh, stuff, uh, which we're pretty excited about in an optical lattice. And um, I'll just uh, get get straight to it. This is the Hamiltonian under consideration. It's a quantum kicked rotor Hamiltonian um, where you have kinetic energy and a pulsed uh, uh, kick, which in the form of delta function, which you would realize by some kind of AC Stark shift in a, in a, in a, in, in a quantum mechanical uh, problem. Uh, and you draw, uh, I, I, uh, draw your attention to the classical kicked rotor which is a textbook example of chaos in classical mechanics. Uh, and this connection between uh, the classical model and quantum chaos uh, has been a strong subject of investigation for decades now. And the first atom optics realization of this uh, of Hamiltonian was by Mark Raisin, uh, followed by several others, in which these kicks were applied by flashes of an optical lattice. Uh, providing essentially what's called a Kapitza-Dirac diffraction uh, pulses, uh, repeating one after the other. And uh, this, this quantum mechanical model um, of this kick rotor has been shown to be equivalent to uh, Anderson, um, uh, the, an aspect of Anderson localization. So this model, this, this Hamiltonian exhibits dynamical localization in momentum space. So if you keep kicking the system, the momentum doesn't increase um, uh, without bound, it saturates, and which is equivalent to a localization behavior in momentum space this is linked to Anderson localization in position space. The classical model, on the other hand, uh, the energy increases uh, basically linearly in time uh, for characteristic of a diffusion process. So this work, uh, we uh, acknowledge great discussions with our collaborator, David Weld, UC Santa Barbara, who's doing these sorts of experiments by turning uh, on uh, Feshbach resonance. And in our case, um, we are using uh, higher densities to, to look at this effect. Also acknowledge theory collaborator, Chuan Wei Zheng at UT Dallas. There's a large body 
theoretical work on quantum key corroders where this localization behavior is supposed to be destroyed, but there were no prior experimental signatures. So now I'll just go straight to our uh, observation of this in a, um, in a low uh, density situation. Uh, what these are, are different momentum states that are excited under the action of this, uh, this rotor, uh, the, under the action of these standing waves. So in a low density situation in a regular uh, 3D trap with low scattering length, some numbers here, we see that the momentum doesn't really change after a while. So there are 40 pulses are applied here. Whilst in a higher density situation, which we achieve in a uh, 2D lattice uh, arrangement, the momentum uh, starts to grow. And if you now plot the energy versus time, um, in the low density case, you see the saturation. In the higher density case, you see this growth. And this growth, uh, you can, in this log plot, you can model and see that it's, um, it obeys some kind of power law with, um, with a exponent, which is actually less than one, uh, uh, indicating it's sub diffusive. We've done some other uh, characterizations of it versus uh, different kick strengths and also reduced density and so on. And here's the, the upshot of this thing that we have observing delocalization momentum space, 1D tubes, um, can be a platform for many body localization, delocalization studies, energy growth measured to be sub diffusive, consistent with some early theoretical models and some more, um, more complete theory, uh, theoretical modeling is, is underway with our collaborator. All right, so I, I won't um, belabor this anymore. These are the things I've been telling you about. And I really want to thank the group that's been doing all of this work. This photograph was of course taken before the pandemic. <laughs> And thanks very much, everyone. You can take more questions. Yeah, thanks. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I have a question. So it's a very nice talk. So regarding the first part of your talk, so you have shown uh, the uh, phase shift in breathing mode. Uh, so is this phase shift related to the collisional phase shift inter species collisional phase shift or is it related to some superfluid hydrodynamics? Okay, uh, thanks, Bimalan, and good to see you again. Um, this uh, the, the, this is, um, can be entirely modeled by looking at the um, Fermi distribution density and treating it as a mean field term. And um, um, uh, so, the density times some effective interspecies scattering length. It can be it can be explained um, by that. Just just using that. The both species are in superfluid regime. Uh, yes. They're... Yes. So these shifts, so they... uh, the actual the value of the shift, can be uh, can be uh, changed by looking at different magnetic fields where the interaction in the Fermi superfluid is different. So the size of the Fermi superfluid is different and therefore the density distribution is different and that changes the value of the, the frequency shift. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any further questions? Oh, uh, since no one is asking, can you detect these molecules in the lithium terbium thing in your Apparatus somehow like that would tell you that you really have a dust. Can I detect the molecules? Um, that the fraction, if you if you look at the the shape and you calculate how much you expect in there, it's actually a very small fraction. Uh, it's maybe ten to the minus three or ten to the minus four, something like that. So uh, we Definitely. we um, of course tried it, <laughs> but uh, it it's uh, it's such a small fraction. We we didn't really expect to see it directly it's getting getting later wow. <laughs> sorry yeah it's it's it yeah. so I understand. Uh, th thank you and uh... thank you very much all right thank you thank you <laughs> okay bye